One day, God told the prophet Samuel that it was time for a new king and sent him to the house of a man named Jesse. Jesse had seven sons and brought out each of them to meet Samuel. Samuel told Jesse that David, his youngest son, would be the future king of Israel. Shortly after this, an army of the Philistines, Israel's enemy, set up camp on a hill right across the valley from Israel's army. For 40 days in a row, a gigantic Philistine warrior named Goliath would walk down to the valley and mock the Israelites. The Israelites were terrified of Goliath and wouldn't fight him. But one day when David was visiting the army camp, he heard Goliath taunting the Israelites and asked why no one was willing to fight Goliath. After getting King Saul's permission, David went down into the valley and shouted to Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Goliath and David charged toward one another. As they ran, David pulled out a stone, put it in a sling, and flung it at the giant. The stone struck Goliath directly in the forehead, and then David killed him with Goliath's own sword. This victory caused David to become so loved and respected that King Saul became very jealous. Filled with fear and rage, Saul tried to kill David, but David escaped into the desert, and Saul and his army followed. One day, Saul was in a cave and David snuck up on him. But David could not bring himself to kill Saul. When Saul realized what had happened, he broke down crying and made a peace treaty with David, promising he would not kill him. But not long after, Saul became jealous and tried to kill David again. About the same time, the Philistines attacked the Israelites and killed all three of Saul's sons. When Saul heard the news, he was so upset that he took out his own sword, fell on it, and killed himself. Then, David was named King of Israel. He made plans to build a giant building called a temple as a place to worship God. But God spoke to David through his friend Nathan, telling him not to build the temple. God said a temple would eventually be built, but by one of David's sons. One of David's descendants would become a king unlike any before, one whose rule would never end. Good morning, church. So I just want to say that I had a great Thanksgiving with our college students. I pray that you had a great Thanksgiving, too. And I just want to give it up for these beautiful Christmas decorations. Isn't that great? Praise God. I'm wanting to know this morning how you define success personally. How would you define success? Usually in our lives, it has to do with um, possessions, position, and power, influence. And those who tout those things have got it. But in our story um, this morning, we learn something different. Sometimes there are very significant things that are truths that we miss but need to know, and they can be revealed in a powerful story. And that is exactly what's happening in the life of David. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Well, that's interesting. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So God looks on the heart. We're often uh, kind of like Saul. We get intoxicated 
with the pursuit of success. And if you've been reading the story, you'll read about Saul and how that happened in his life. And he stood tall, but his pride and intoxication with success led him to fall hard. And so Samuel said to go and commission a new king. And then we find ourselves at Jesse's house. He, he has all of these sons. And we read in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance. So Samuel thought this eldest son looked pretty strong, pretty good looking. He's got status in the family. And the Lord goes, I'm not looking at that. So that might be our first takeaway, even though it's not my first point. We might be looking at the wrong things. Some people have indoctrinated our brains to determine what is successful in our lives. You each have your list. You know, it's hard for me to go to a pastor's meeting without people talking about buildings, bodies, and bucks. That's usually what's thrown out at clergy circles. And those of you who know me, I just, I love being in those meetings and messing with people who don't know me. <laughs> How big's your church? Oh, we're pushing about 12,000 right now, but we're just getting started. Really? Yeah, we baptized 300 people last week. I just lie to them. <laughs> well, they deserve it, right? I mean, it's not what life's about. I go home and repent. <laughs> <laughs> I am really squirrely today. God says, I'm not looking at any of these sons. Ratchets them through. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hey, Dave, we're going to go over. You need to turn on my timer. <laughs> this is great. I got the first five minutes free. <laughs> this is great. Here's a giganticus lesson. Character still counts. If you follow God's plan, character still counts. And if you're a businessman here today, you'll know that that's still very important. Character still counts. If you're a student here today, you know that character still counts. And that's a God principle, not like an American cultural principle. So remember that. It's really sad. Samuel goes, you got any other boys? And his dad goes, yeah, there's, there's one out in the field. The Hebrew word means the runt is out in the field. It's like the throwaway boy, youngest born. How many youngest? You got a youngest here? Yeah, you know, it's like you can never, ever measure up. They'll never let you grow up. You're always the baby. That was him. Samuel says, go get him. We're not going to eat until he comes. These other seven sons are like, go get him. <laughs> We're hungry. <laughs> what can we learn from this story? David teaches us to be faithful in the little things. Sometimes we're dreaming of our big break, that, that golden opportunity, you know, that nest egg, that promotion, that thing that's going to put us on the map, you know, that guy that comes along and sweeps you off your feet, something that's just really big for you. And David never got that. For God, success in his eyes is to be faithful where God has placed you now. Be faithful in the small things. His brothers hated him. David didn't care. David's person was deemed unworthy. He was the runt. 
Don't let people look down and despise you because of your youth. But show yourselves faithful to God. David's work was deemed menial. Tending sheep was right up there with cleaning toilets. I'm not kidding you. It was like the worst job. You had to live out in the field. Most, almost all shepherds did not own any of the sheep, all right? They were hired hands for the owners of the sheep. They got paid less than minimum wage and horrible conditions, hot during the day, freezing cold at night. But... This faithfulness cultivated a relationship with God. For example, Psalm 143.8, Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. You go through the rat race of life, you're not going to just pull those kind of things out of the air. David walked with God, and you and I need to walk with God too. We need him in our lives, especially in the rat race. His devotion molded a faithful man that God recognized and called him a man after his own heart. And because of that, David's faith and confidence in the Lord grew. He just didn't become a great shepherd He started as a newbie one day, and he learned how to tend sheep. He learned to be faithful, and he did his job, and he did it to the glory of God. It really doesn't matter your profession. Are you letting uh, your life be deepened in a relationship with God and strengthening your faith so that your confidence in him can build? That's what's important. All of David's faithfulness of sharpening his skills in the field, prepared him for God's service, as we shall see shortly. So be faithful in the little things. You know, I really wished I'd get promoted. Well, be the best person at the job that you have right now. Next, God's calling you to courageous faith. That's right, he just does not want you, listen to me, to just like plug along in your life, or whatever level of faith you're at right now, to just kind of stay there and coast. God means to cultivate men and women that he can use with courageous faith. If that's going to happen, our passion for the Lord must grow. Now, David just didn't want to know about God. He longed for him. If you're in a small group, you should ask the question, how can our passion for God grow? Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. These are David's words. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So let me just pause and say, he just didn't make that up as poetry. The guy knew what it was like to be out in the field when it was dry, and the next water hole was quite a ways away, and as they walked towards it, he felt that thirst. And then his walk with God had him thinking, that's how it is with me. I want him that much. I want to thirst for him like I I thirst for water right now. 63 verse 2, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Can you feel the passion that this guy has for God? He's not just like a brain on a stick here. This is somebody who feels emotion for God and wants more of him. We need more of that in our lives. If my charismatic brothers and sisters have taught me anything, it's that we can have, it's okay to have passion for God. And we need that in our lives. But not only will a passion grow for God, but God wants you to exercise courageous faith. 1 Samuel 17, 34, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, 
And when there was a lion or a bear uh, came, I took a hold of, uh, when a bear and a lion came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck and killed him. That's kind of impressive. He didn't walk out there in his first day and do that. He learned what it was like to see a sheep mangled. And his faith in God grew as he knew he had to rise up and defend these sheep against the lion. And God gave him the courage to do that, and he was successful. And David's confidence in God and his growing skill and experience as a shepherd helped him to be able to step up when he needed courageous faith to take on Goliath. These words were uttered to King Saul in the presence of one of Israel's greatest threats. The Philistines had come. There was kind of this standoff. Nobody wanted another war in the heat of the day. And so every day, this giant would appear. Goliath would come for 40 days. This larger-than-life warrior challenged Israel. He thought, let's just have one of your guys and me, and winner takes all. 40 days he comes. He's taunting God. He's making fun of the living God. He's taunting the people of Israel. Come, who's going to do this? Winner takes all. Come. So David shows up, his father sends him to take some provisions, see how the sons are doing in the battle. So David goes, and his brothers see him, and they taunt him. He's like, eh, who'd you leave your few sheep with? That's what he actually says. For David, this was not just about a Philistine giant. This passion that he had cultivated for God meant that this threat was someone mocking the living God that he loved with all of his heart. This is important. The honor of the living God was at stake. So he says to the king, your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. You could get pretty cocky about that, couldn't you? Listen to the very next words. For he has defiled the armies of the living God. See, for him, it was always about God's glory. How about you and me, the things that we do? Are they for God's glory or ours? Now, to exercise courageous faith, your faith must see beyond the circumstances. This is very important. Because you're going to be called to do things, maybe in this church, where the circumstances, you're like, I can't do that. You're going to be called to do things, maybe in your marriage, and you're like, I just cannot do this anymore. How do you see beyond the circumstances? Well, it's not going to be like, you know, reading eight books on marriage or four on parenting. or What's going to really decide it in the end is going to be your passion for God. David came into this battle so loving God that an over nine-foot giant did not deter him. This guy was huge, nine-plus feet. His coat of armor weighed 156 pounds, just carrying that around. His spear was like 26 feet long, and the head of the spear weighed 17 pounds, and he could throw that baby. This guy, as Saul rightly said, was trained to kill and be a warrior at youth. And he said to David, you don't know any of this stuff. And David's like, let me at him. <laughs> what in the world made this possible to look beyond circumstances? A passionate love for the living God cultivated in obscurity as a shepherd. So if you're in that place right now, if you're in a closet somewhere in your life right now, don't waste that. Let God cultivate in you a love for him and a confidence in him that this God of ours can do anything, anything at all. And he wants to do it through you. For you, that might be being faithful as a mom in hard times. 
It might mean God raising you up to save a company. It might mean a courageous student living for Jesus Christ on this campus and holding your head high because this living Lord Jesus Christ still changes lives by his power. Your faith must give glory to God. Look at how that happens with David in verse 5. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with the sword and with the spear and with the javelin. Now he could have said, and I am going to kick your butt. <laughs> but he doesn't. He goes, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. So I am going to face this marriage in the name of the Lord of hosts. I am going to deal with my financial crisis in the name of the Lord of hosts. I am going to face this horrible loss in my life right now in the name of the Lord of hosts. That is what's going to see us through. And so he's, he did. I'm going to give your dead bodies of the host of the Philistine this day to the birds of the air that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear. And with one stone, he takes him down. Knocks him out. Goes over and takes a Goliath's sword because he didn't have one. <laughs> Cuts off his head. You know, these make great movies, but they always mess something up. If they just stick with the biblical text, it just would be so good. But they always got to mess it up with the Hollywood movies. I should make a movie about this and just, you know, have the whole thing in there. I bet it took both hands to lift up that head. It was so heavy. And everybody's just like, he did it! <laughs> And they're screaming, and in the army, somebody had the wisdom. It's like, attack! <laughs> and they go, oh, crush the Philistines. Because one person had the courage. Can you be that one person in your marriage? Would you be that one person in your family? Would you be that one person in your business? who would say, I don't care what happens. I'm going to honor the Lord of hosts. I'm following Jesus. You can be that person. Whew. Next, God actually rewards faithfulness. He does. Maybe one of the greatest motivations for us to be faithful to him, even though it's kind of selfish, is that God's going to reward it. God is with us in the upper story going, I want you to trust me and to be faithful, and I will reward you because I have a plan for your life. You might not even understand that plan with everything that you're going through right now, but I have a plan for your life in my upper story. And if you trust me, if you love me and have the courage to faithfully serve me, I will reward you. And we see that here, mostly in 1 Samuel 18. First off, David's raised up in the king's service. He is anointed as the king. He's actually called the anointed one. So in the upper story, he's actually a picture of of Jesus because the words anointed one translated into Hebrew mean Messiah. So he is a picture of that one who would come, faithful servant. He's also rewarded with Jonathan. Remember the guy who had no friends, his brothers hated him, and he's out there in, in the shepherd fields, and God gives him Jonathan, somebody that became his closest friend for his whole life. And, and, and Jonathan had to risk a lot for that too because he was the king's son. But these two guys, their soul is 
is bound together, and he went from isolated loneliness to lifelong trusted friend. God blesses David with continual victories. We are told, and David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. First Samuel 18, verse 14. And everything he did, he had great success because, listen, the Lord was with him. I don't care you know, if your job is cleaning toilets and gas stations, I have this vision, by the way, that some fifth Sunday of the month, we're just going to can church. We're going to all come here and get buckets. <laughs> and we're going to go throughout Marshall, and we're going to offer to clean gas stations, restrooms, and just have them scratching their heads going, why would they do that? And they might ask us, and we're going to tell them, because we love you and Jesus loves you. And he's a servant. Wouldn't you just love to do that sometime? There's a big side benefit. You wouldn't have to hear me preach that Sunday. <laughs> we should do that though. Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that just be wonderful? Why can we be successful and rewarded in life? Because the Lord is with us. See, we forget that. When it's your home that's coming apart, you forget that the Lord is with you. Come here and you sing, the Lord is with us. And you're like, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Go home, you forget it. He is with you. He is with you there. He's with you in that boardroom. He's with you on campus. He's with you. That's what made David successful. And um, Samuel's very careful to have us remember that. So we're about to enter Christmas time. Matthew 123 says, The virgin shall be with child, and he shall give, she shall give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. David was successful because God was with him. And now God unfolds the greatest story ever told and gives us Emmanuel. And that name means God is with us. Don't you ever forget that. Don't you ever forget that. No matter what you're going through, God is with us. Never to leave again. Jesus ascends on high and gives his Holy Spirit. And those who trust him have God's Spirit come inside of them. And he's always with you. Always. Never to leave. That is the coolest thing in the whole world. And if you're seeking today, he loves you. And he wants to be with you forever. Well, faithfulness is always going to be tested and purified, always. This side of heaven, things break. This side of heaven, people die. This side of heaven, businesses sometimes go down. This side of heaven, you're going to have conflicts in your marriage. This side of heaven, trials and testings are inevitable. Inevitable. I was preparing this sermon, and I found the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. And I read these words. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. That is God's heart. If you are in the furnace today, his design is to not hurt you, to mess with you, to ruin your life, to crunch your dreams. His design is for you to be something very precious to him, like gold. When you put it in the fire and all the impurities bubble off and they pour it in the mold and you have something that's pure, that's God's design for you and for me. Well, David had his testings too. 
the jealousy of Saul. For 14 years, he hunts him down. Twice he hurls a spear at him, tries to pin him to the wall. That was horrible. His whole life. What do you think he's wrestling with then? Jonathan's like, no, you're good. And David goes in 1 Samuel 20, verse 3, yeah, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there's only a step between death and me. And so he flees. You read the Psalms. He's like, God, he's wrestling with God like you and I can in our trial. It's like, I don't understand why this happened. Why is this trial and pain come upon? You can do this with God. He wants to hold you and let you pour out your heart to him. He means for your good, not evil. Twice he could have killed Saul in the caves, and yet he yields to the Lord to sustain his life. Yielding. That's a big word in the midst of trials and suffering. Yielding. And there was the opposition of his wife. They got the ark. They're bringing it in to the city. And he's just full of joy and he's dancing. And uh, McCall, the daughter of Saul, gets prideful and is embarrassed by him. So she's rebuking him. It was heartbreaking and pretty much ended that marriage. His victories mount. It's time to bring the ark in. And so they start bringing it on a cart. And one of David's friends, Uzzah, sees the ox stumble and the ark's tipping. And he runs up to do a wonderful thing and he pushes the ark back so that it won't fall off the cart and he dies instantly. The holiness of God just struck him dead. And David, and you are, as you hear this story, you're just like grief-stricken. And you're like... How could God do that? He's doing a good thing. Till we find out that in David's purification, he too had to learn that we have to obey and follow God's word. And God had clearly instructed them, and it was in writing that when you move that ark, there are rings, and you put two poles through the ark, and people lift it up on their shoulders and carry it. You don't put it on a cart. And they had disobeyed God, and it just crushed them. They left the ark for quite a while out of the city because of David's grief and learning, testing, purifying his heart. The purifying of David's heart he wants to do the same in your life. David could have just said, that's it. You're going to do that kind of stuff. I'm out of here. You can find another king. I'm done. That was a raw deal that you did, God. But he was willing to kneel before God's throne and weep and grieve and find God's truth where he needed to be purified. He chose, and you might be really tired right now because of all of the Thanksgiving turkey, but stay with me. He chose to not go bitter and harden his heart against God. He chose to allow his heart to be broken before the one that he had passion for. And God raised him up, and he became an incredible king. So don't go bitter. Don't give up. Psalm 69, 1, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The flood engulfs me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. And I pray to you, Lord, that in the time of your favor and your great love, O oh God, answer me with your sure salvation. Those words would never be in the Bible to comfort my heart and to give me courage to live for God as your pastor if David had not gone through the hell that he did. And he found hope in God. 
And you and I can find that same hope because this is true. And we must embrace that truth and be drawn to him. And then it came that God made that special covenant with David. Now then tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. My love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever. That was a promise that God makes. And God keeps his covenants. He is a promise-keeping God. And I want you to know this morning that he has made a promise to you. It is called the new covenant. And that promise was made to you through Jesus, who was the perfect sacrifice of all sacrifices, paid for our sins forever and ever, brought us back into fellowship and family with God forever and ever, never ever to be removed again. It is a permanent promise. It is a promise that you can cling to forever. No matter what your gut feels, no matter what your circumstances are, this God will not fail you. He has promised to be with you forever and ever. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is a true verse. He makes you right with God. He fills your life with his love, with his promise, and with eternal life. Therefore, if anyone was in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So we have to come. The greatest Christmas gift ever is given to you. Would you come and receive Jesus Christ into your life and accept the new covenant that he is giving you life and hope and his presence forever and ever, no matter what you are facing? If you do that, I can promise you that you will have a great Christmas. You will. Because like David, you will know that he is with me. God is with us forever. Well, I want to pray, have worship team come, we'll close. God, I thank you for these beautiful men and women. I thank you for the truth of your word that showed us in the life of David, your faithfulness to us. You are a promise-keeping God, and you raised him up, and you used him in a powerful way, God, and you want to use us to be courageous in our homes, courageous in our marriages, courageous in our businesses, courageous on campus, because Jesus is here giving us new life and hope to be courageous. And so I pray for those here who are hearing Jesus knocking on the door of their heart. Let me come in. Let me give you this promise and this covenant to forgive you of all of your sin and shame, to give you new life and joy and hope for the future. Let me do that for you. I'm here. I am here. God is with you. Receive that gift today. Just say, yes, I want that promise in my life. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.